All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Abrinidis. I'm the Computer Science Working Coordinator, and it's my pleasure to have you here today on this sunny day, apparently, and uh, introduce uh, Dr. Erin Walker, who's going to introduce the speaker. So, hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here to see our speaker, Dr. Akash Dadam, and uh, he's here at PIC. He has a joint appointment in computer science and in ICDS, and um, previously, he was at San Francisco State University, and his work focuses on community-centered design. So I'm really excited to hear all about it. Yeah, thank you, Erin, and thank you, Alex, for having me here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's pretty sunny out there, so thank you for spending the time inside, even though it may be tempting to go outside. Um, uh, as Erin said, uh, my name is Akash. Uh, I recently joined uh, the School of Computing and Information here at Pitt. Uh, I have dual appointment in computer science as well as in the ICDS department. Uh, before coming to Pitt, I've moved around a lot, uh, a bit, um, and that kind of shapes a lot of my perspectives about design and about work, and I want to kind of be transparent about that. I was born in Nepal, I grew up in Nepal. At, during my high school days, there was an open one laptop per child project that came from MIT Media Lab that came to Nepal, and that kind of shaped my perspective of what could be possible with computing technologies. Even though I saw, I volunteered for a project after high school instead of choosing to go to college and worked on it, and it but it failed. Still, some of the notions of computing as a tool for social good remains with me. After that, I did engineering in India. I worked for a couple of years as a software engineer at PayPal, and then I moved to graduate studies at Virginia Tech. That is where a majority of my reshaping of what technology for social good can be happened. Uh, after graduation, I joined San Francisco State, where I worked for a couple of years before moving to University of Pittsburgh. Other than these academic pathways, I also enjoy cooking and eating more of the eating than the cooking side. Um, I, I do watch what I call football, what many of you call soccer a lot. Uh, my research is primarily in the field of human-computer interaction. Um, the field is quite broad. How many of you here are not familiar with human-computer interaction or haven't taken a human-computer interaction class? Okay, okay, one, okay. So in, in general, like HCI or like human computer interaction or HCI is concerned with the design and use of computing technology. Now this is quite broad. What does design and use mean? Um, if you think about it, like in, in case of HCI, it encompasses these innovation and opportunities to adapt in every stage of the technology design process because design and use is quite broad a topic. So questions such as how do we approach people? Who do we even approach to solve a problem? What sort of methods do we design to listen to people? And I'll show you an example of that in a short while. How we design and what do we choose to design? Acknowledging the developers or the researchers' power in that relationship. How do we iterate over the development process? Who do we include in that iteration? And of course, with usability studies and social impact, we also look at how do we evaluate our design solutions and how do we maintain and sustain those solutions. I have a much simpler question that I often ask my students, which is, what is the right thing to do? And how do you know you've done it? Those two questions often encompass all of HCI research in very general terms. At Sky, there's a range of HCI work going on, including errands um, um, that you know, that is being led through all the departments within Sky Computer Science, DINS, as well as ICDS. Our lab's flavor of HCI is heavily community-based that focuses on co-designing socio-technical systems, particularly to empower community partners and broader stakeholders. This is quite broad, again, like the definition. So what does this entail? And I've tried to distill it into three pillars in my work. First is the focus on methods. How do we go in? How, how do we study a particular setting? And how do we design that? Uh, our lab's work is participatory in nature. That means we involve the community all throughout the design process. We try to build some of the values that we want to achieve at the end of the endeavor within the method. So it's prefiguring or pre-configuring some of those values in the design process. And primarily, over the years, I've been advocating against the incessant demand of needs, like going in and asking people what they need, and instead looking at what is already working in that setting so that we can amplify that first before thinking about needs. And so all of these 
focus on the methods. The second pillar in my work or in our lab's work is looking at technology as a means, no, not an end. So this involves understanding users' goals and aspirations, thinking about how do we overcome some of the social limitations that may exist when technology is put in place, and also thinking about what happens when our project ends, how do we sustain this. And finally, we look at prioritizing relation building, that is, to focus on building relationship as the end goal of the endeavor. I know it doesn't sound computer science-y, there is no systems involved, but system is a means to support that relationship building exercise. And so we focus on how do we build trust, how do we earn trust, and also looking at how do we attend to the power dynamics that may be present in the setting. And more importantly, acknowledging that academia has historically been very extractive in nature, we think about how to build reciprocity through slow steps when working with the communities. And we'll revisit this as I talk about the two particular projects. So today I'm gonna to talk about two projects. The first one involved supporting women who survived sex trafficking in Nepal, working with a nonprofit organization there. Uh, this is a six year long project, uh, which was part of my dissertation work. And the second one is to support individuals uh, who were formerly incarcerated and now are embarking on the journey of re-entering into society. And this is an ongoing work. It's been around one and a half years since we've started working here. So the first project of, that was based in Nepal, this, just to give you a background of the context, um, Nepal is a major source of source country for human trafficking. Uh, it is estimated anywhere from 16,000 to 18,000 women were trafficked, uh, are trafficked around 9,000 annually uh, is, is a, a good count of it or an agreed upon count. It's pretty difficult to count that because of the open border with India in the south. And in fact, that open border is one of the busiest site of human trafficking in the world. There are several factors that contribute to this large numbers, including poverty in Nepal, the, like the prevalence of patriarchal values, illiteracy, caste structure and hierarchies, the 10 year civil war, and several natural disasters, including the 2015 earthquake. So the survivors who, who are res often rescued or who voluntarily join shelter homes or organizations for help are vulnerable due to many reasons. They're mostly young women. Um, majority of them have very little education. Uh, there is a huge stigma associated partly because of the patriarchal values in Nepali society against survivors of trafficking. And they have very little sources of social support including like the anti-trafficking organization, which, is few, which are fewer than the numbers, number of survivors. As part of my work, I worked with two uh, non-profit organizations in Nepal. One of them, I'll call them professional organization. They are a large anti-trafficking organization in Nepal. And the other one I'll call survivor-led organization or SO, which, is, which was founded by survivors of trafficking and is currently run by the survivors themselves. I began this work with an initial ethnographic style study of the field setting. And in that, we noticed lots of things, but some of the things that kind of influenced our work is that the organization was very much dependent on donor organizations, international donor organizations that themselves were influenced by the United States Trafficking in Persons report that said we should prioritize these goals. They may or may not match with the reality on the ground, but the interconnectedness of multiple networks of organization kind of influenced the programs that the uh, organization in Nepal ran. Uh, Partly because they relied on donors, they needed to highlight the deficiencies and problems of the survivors. This was a primary, like, import, of great importance to them. So stories, they were, survivors were often asked to recall stories of trouble or harm that they may have faced. Also in the process, we learned that there was ambiguity on what counted as successful reintegration. There wasn't quite a clear definition of what counted as that successful point of reintegration. From the sister survivors perspective, and I use sister survivors to kind of align with Nepali values and the way I call them in Nepal, um, they had limited future prospects. Most of the programs that the organization provided did not scale or work outside of the shelter home. 
They also mentioned that they had pain in recalling their traffic past, which was required as part of the like highlighting deficiency work of the organization. They were also fearful of the social stigma and felt helpless considering the societal powers that they were up against. And so in all of this, we find that they were really vulnerable within the shelter home. At the same time, the, of course, the sister survivors were dependent on the organization, but partly because of the donor structures and the need of having to show that they're supporting the survivors, the organizations were also dependent on the sister survivors. So these observations had several implications on our approach as we look, as we look to move forward. First, the ambiguity in successful reintegration meant that we needed to engage with the power differences with different societal actors and in institutions. There was a need to balance multiple people's or multiple stakeholders' priorities and goals. The, the focus on deficiency often put the sister survivors in a position of harm or feeling less than. There was significant power differences. And if we were to attend the power differences, we needed to move away from that deficiency perspective. And that meant looking at what assets are already there and then designing based on those assets, trying to amplify those things that work well. Also because the sister survivors mentioned that they felt pain when recalling the past meant that our methods needed to focus on the sister survivors present and the future avoiding the the questions or the interviews that are typically done which involves looking at the past so that we can plan for the future and finally the codependence or interdependence between the organization also meant that we needed to figure out a way to balance the goals for both the organization and the sister survivors even when the goals did not quite align now, what I want to do now is I've, I've kind of given you the whole larger picture of the whole work, but I want to go into the nitty gritty smaller parts of the method just to show you how participatory design can happen in, in settings such as this. And one of the challenges that we noticed early on was that there was significant power distance between me and the sister survivors as a male with some beard coming from the United States into a primarily female setting with notebooks taking notes of how they are behaving, which is required as part of the research, there was significant distance. Uh, oftentimes, like the staff members were mediating the interviews. So if I asked a question, the staff members would rephrase the questions, sometimes completely differently, and oftentimes were answering on behalf of the sister survivors. Also, because of things like IRB, I needed to use words like project and research, which further added to that distance. I was hearing something, but not quite clearly hearing a lot of those, those nuanced voices from the sister survivors. So I needed to rethink what kind of methods do we deploy in this setting. And in my early ethnographic style work, I'd noticed posters like these all across the organization's walls. These are posters created by sister survivors that uses, I know the print isn't that good, it's an old poster, uh, with like newspaper cutouts and some written text to convey certain information. Right? They're expressing themselves in one corner over there, there's a small kind of like a poem written. So there's an expression happening through the use of cutouts and written text on a large poster. What that meant is we could adapt that or appropriate that to some extent to create a new method that reduced the power differences. And to that end, I deployed a uh, approach called social photo elicitation, where we handed over instant print cameras to a group of sister survivors and requested them to take photos of anything they wanted. There wasn't a particular task at hand. The photos, they brought back the photos two days later and we discussed those photos as if they were communally owned or collectively owned. Rather than only the photographer talking about the photos, everybody took chance to kind of express what they understood from these photos. And at the end of the round of discussion with each photo, they came up with a communally agreed upon statement that worked as a caption of the collection of photos. Uh, this seemed to help because from this we learned quite a bit including some of the strengths that the sister survivors had that they weren't explicitly acknowledging. And this brings up a problem. Like if you go and ask a stranger, what do you need? It's a much easier question to answer. You may say, oh, I need the sun to be warmer tonight or today or tomorrow, right? But if you go and say, what is your strength? What would someone say? Like if somebody asked you, what is your strength? What would you say, right? So acknowledging or identifying those strengths are quite challenging. And to kind of have these indirect methods 
helps sometimes to kind of reflect on some of the things that work for you. And from the photo elucidation activity, we identified two strengths. One of them was their crafting skills that they were learning in the shelter home as part of the organization's uh, efforts to support the survivors. Uh, they created local handicrafts like glass bead necklaces as well as slippers and some clothes uh, that were to be sold in the local market. But this strength had some problems, including the fact that demand for these handicrafts were decreasing in Nepali market and there wasn't quite a lot of demand outside of Nepal. The other strength is more implicit where we noticed that the sister survivors often relied on one another to get help with the crafting process as well as to seek advice in what they should do within the shelter home. So the prospect of having like for having lived there in the shelter home for a long time had strengthened the bond between them which was fragile like once they moved out of the shelter home they would be dispersed all across the country so it was also of fragile strength but still a strength nonetheless so these two were strengths that we could amplify as we think about what to do next now i do my expertise is technical we build systems so there's the notion of what kind of systems could we build if at all and in this case, there was a potential of thinking about computing systems, uh, but there were also limitations. The sister survivors did not have access to computers or phones, partly to protect them, but partly also because of the lack of resources within the organization. They had limited text and digital literacy. Uh, previously, the organization had tried to introduce computing to the group of sister survivors through a Photoshop training exercise, but they found it overwhelming because they did not consider that they had never used a laptop before when they introduced the Photoshop activity. But everyone involved, including the organization and the sister survivors, were interested in learning computers. So that opened up a pathway for us to explore computing as a potential way to amplify some of these strengths. So to that end, we designed a web application tailored for this context and then subsequently designed several technologies to support the sister survivors. The first technology we designed to kind of facilitate introduction to computing was a web application called Hamrokala, which means our craft in Nepali. The, uh, the web application was contextualized around crafting, partly because we believed that introducing it in a familiar context would help lower the barrier in using computers, in learning to use computers, and would help in introducing computers there. Uh, they, the web application asked them to post handicrafts as if for sale, so kind of like Etsy but in a much tailored way with video and audio content uh, more than writing or typing. Um, there were concerns about online safety, so the server was hosted locally and not connected to the internet. To overcome issues around digital and text literacy, the web application had voice annotation embedded across all the elements. So this voice annotation was slightly different than some of the, the screen reader based annotation that you notice in that, that it tried to explain it in a way that was clear or understandable to the sister survivors. For example, when you hear the word log out, it makes sense to us because we're so familiar to it. But somebody who does not have that level of digital literacy or familiarity, log out is not a sensible word. So in our case, instead of saying log out, we said something in Nepali that was like, to leave this technology, press here. So when they hovered over the log out button, it would play a sound. Sorry, it, it should play a sound. It would play a sound that said, to leave this technology, press here. And this was presented as a conversation, as if they were having a conversation with an expert user with, who spoke in a familiar intonation in a female voice. So there were decisions made to kind of ensure that familiarity there. And as you can see, it's not efficient, right? Like log out is a single word, but to leave this technology, press here is six words for the same thing. So here we were, we were emphasizing it to go beyond an efficient information source to more be about scaffolding the interaction. Oh, now it please. Uh, to build on the mutual bond, we, we created facilities where they could share crafts and drawings with just their local community before they posted it supposedly online. They could leave audio comments on other people's crafts or copy the crafts and build on top of it, including with sketches. 
Now, that was about the technological artifact, but just de designing the technology is not enough. How you introduce it also matters. And in our case, we designed an associated workshop to introduce the web application. It began with general discussions of computers and its values, eventually introducing the tailored web application to the sister survivors. This happened over a course of 10 days to introduce the web application. Overall, in those workshops, we noticed that despite the prior problems with technology that they had faced in the Photoshop session, the sister survivors could use Hamrokala. They created 47 video clips, 45 audio comments on each other's crafts, and there were 38 drawings or sketches of their crafts or the crafts that they wanted to build. They appeared to like using Hamrokala, saying that this was a fun exercise beyond the novelty effect, that they were happy to see others uh, work as well. And the staff members, when we presented this work at the end of the session, were surprised on how well they could use computers. Given the prior experience, I think that also helped here. Uh, we were able to replicate Hamrokala with 10 other sister survivors uh, in a, another group. Uh, this group was slightly different in the sense that they had all started going to school. Uh, they were in grades one, which is the first grade in Nepal, to grade three. Um, so here they are slightly more prolific, partly because of their familiarity with text and a little bit of asp greater aspirations with technology. So they created more uh, clips, but the pattern of use was similar in the both groups. They also negotiated practices in the space when it came to be about technology. How should a computer be used? What should you say in when selling a craft? What should the price of a craft be? How do you determine those prices and so on? This success with uh, technology kind of opened up space for us to think about how do we extend this forward. Uh, we sought to expand on their technical skills towards more general systems like Google search and Wikipedia. Uh, and through that, we expanded their world knowledge and ability to find out more about the world. We also sought to uh, think about how do we get their skills in the broader context of the society, to include other societal actors and institutions and to engage with them, which was a form of more political empowerment, if you will. One of the exercises that we extended it with was to kind of introduce Google search. We first connected them to the internet after talking about what it means to be safe on the internet. We created rules for them to pay attention to whenever they went to a particular website. We, had, we noticed that when they were using Google, they were often searching for cartoons or their hometowns that they missed. They often relied on YouTube videos to look around their neighborhoods or their hometowns. So in, 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 as part of the exercise, we began with seven questions to search on Google. Uh, we introduced Google Translate so that English didn't become a barrier. And English is indeed a major language in Nepali internet search as it's across the world. So whenever, whatever questions they had, they would put it in Google Translate and then translate to English before searching for it. So for example, like if we had a question that says, who's the author of Cinderella? And so they identified keywords that they would like to ask in, uh, to, they would like to put into the Google search. They would translate those keywords to English. Then, then they searched using those keywords only. And then whatever result they got, they translated back to Nepali so that they could uh, understand the result. They loved the exercise, so we, they came up with 10 additional questions to work around in their groups, which opened up an opportunity for us to, uh, to, ex to do an exercise around Wikipedia. Uh, that's because a lot of the Google searches led them to Wikipedia articles, which was much difficult to translate. Wikipedia text is not easily understandable for somebody without a proficiency in English. Even Google Translate for Nepali fails in those cases. So we expanded the exercise to contribute to Nepali Wikipedia. So what that meant was they selected a topic of their interest and translated portion of the existing, if there was an existing English wiki article, they translated that to Nepali. Oftentimes, those topics of interest weren't there in English Wikipedia as well. They interpreted the translated content and then compared it with what existed in Nepali Wikipedia page. And Nepali Wikipedia isn't that rich, so oftentimes this came out empty. 
and then they typed in the new information that they had found from English Wikipedia. Uh, eventually, through this exercise, they created and edited four Nepali Wikipedia pages. I checked today morning and all these four pages exist even now. These were around becoming a veterinarian doctor, a lawyer, uh, about Annapurna circuit, which is a popular tourist destination because some of them wanted to be tourist guides afterwards, and about another tourist des destination called Thunche, which is in northern part of Nepal. This opened up, this exercise with Wikipedia opened up a discussion on alternatives and broader possibilities. Because they were working on things that they cared about beyond what the organization was providing them, we, it ensued discussion on things that they could do to achieve those goals. For example, a sister survivor who I call S2 in the papers, uh, who was in grade seven at that time, wanted to become an accountant. Uh, she worked on translating uh, pays for chief financial officer, which talked about the degree requirements of getting what do you need to do in your 11th and 12th grade, as well as in college to become something like a chief financial officer. In fact, last time I, I checked in Nepal, she was studying a finance course in her 11th grade right now. So there's, there's been improvement in not saying that this kind of enabled that, but this kind of exercise enabled opportunities for these alternative envisionment and the thinking about broader possibilities beyond what was presented in the shelter home. We also tried few other things around the crafts uh, which did not work well. And acknowledging these failures are also important as part of the exercise. It is an exploratory exercise. And in one of our studies, we learned that the sisters would want to learn about new ways to create crafting. And Ada Fruit Flora, all these microcontrollers that have sewable electronics, allow an easy way to engage with computing in a way that could be meaningful for those who are already doing crafting. So considering that, we ran two workshops where we introduced Adafruit Flora and the LEDs, and which they sewed into the existing crafts that they were creating. Each of the workshop had seven sessions. Each session was around two hours long. So it was an extensive work on the microcontrollers and the LEDs. Uh, they they participated in the session where they sewed these electronic components in different crafts of theirs. And uh, they told me what pattern of lights they want in those LED lights, and I programmed it into those patterns. They loved the electronics. That worked really well, like the exercise with the electron, because there's novelty to it. But they did not see this as a possibility, partly because this was within the context of crafting, which none of them wanted to do after the shelter home. So because it was tied to crafting as a practice, this exercise did not work. This did not open up those broader possibilities and alternatives for the sister survivors. All of these skills needed to be situated within the broader context of their lives, in the society outside of the shelter home. Yes, computing skills are important, but the larger goal is empowered reintegration into society, that is with dignity. And so for that, we sought to think about how they see themselves and their circumstances in the future, and how they could leverage some of their skills, including the newly learned computing skills in the broader context of their lives. So we designed a future envisioning exercise where we asked them to envision their different aspects of their lives one year from now, three years from now, and five years from now. Uh, which we later changed it to different milestones that they cared about, that is one year within the shelter home, after, immediately after they leave the shelter home, and at the point when they think they are successful. This also led us to discuss a lot about their role in tackling some of these societal problems and thinking about how they engage with institutions that work in solving these societal problems. Uh, the two problems that we prominently discussed were around child marriage, which they had seen around their neighborhood before, and human trafficking, of which they themselves were pre had previously been victim of. And so we talked about the different roles that they could play, the different skills that they could have, and the different institutions and actors that they could engage with, such as they have some agency when they leave the shelter home. This led to like fascinating discussions around 
their own responsibility, but also the importance of doing having collective action. Uh, for example, one of the sister survivors said that they've learned new things here in the shelter home with the technology, that they ought to share it with other members of the community. And this kind of value became was quite prominent all throughout our discussions. That is all I had to say about the first project. I'll pause here. Uh, if you have any short questions, otherwise I'll take questions at the end as well. Any first thoughts on the project? Yes. There were a few questions in the chat. Oh, uh, I'll look at the chat at the end, I think. Yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, it, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, it was. That's a good question. Yeah, For the sake of time, I couldn't get into the details of it. Some did not know how to read Nepali. They were in first grade, which is basic, like first grade is like the elementary school first year. And uh, so in those cases, we paired them up with somebody who could, because remember that mutual support was there, there's mutual bond. And the person who was supporting them often guided them in reading and translating and typing it on in the keyboard. So that helped, like having that social element attached to those technical activities helped a lot. All right, if no questions, then I'll move forward. This one will be slightly briefer because this is an ongoing work in working, uh, in supporting people who were formerly incarcerated and now are in their re-entry journey in the United States. There are significant parallels, particularly the, the stigma attached and the lack of support available to many of the people here in the US. Uh, this work is in collaboration with a nonprofit organization in San Francisco, and it began a year and a half ago with a set of interviews with the staff members or discussions, and which led us to run three rounds of group discussions with returning community members. Uh, I use the term returning community members. In scholarship, you'll see returning citizens, but many of the people who are incarcerated in the United States are not citizens of the United States. In fact, the numbers are, can, are, have been reported to be as high as 15% right now. And so I use the term returning community members. Um, we co-designed digital literacy system for the organization to use as part of their support activity for formerly incarcerated individuals. We are currently evaluating and iterating the system, so it's an ongoing work. But I wanted to share some details of this to show you how these work in parallel, the, how there are striking similarities between the two projects. Just to give you a background of the context, um, and upwards of 600,000 people are released from state and federal prisons every year in the United States. When, when people say it's an, it's an carceral state, it is indeed a carceral state. We, there is an estimate that there is upwards of four or five million people who have had a criminal history in the United States. That number is, that has a staggering racial disparity. In California, where this work is primarily based, black Americans and Latinx individuals are 9.3 and 2.3 two times more likely to be incarcerated than white Americans. The national average goes upwards of five times uh, for, for black Americans. Uh, the school to prison pipeline means that many of the returning community members do not have high school or college degrees. Um, the warehousing model in which most of the prison systems are run means that there is little opportunities for people to develop or rehabilitate within the prison system. So once they leave the prison system, they are Kind of, and outside the prison system, the support is quite limited. So they, they're kind of left in a way that is, does not quite board, does not align with the popular belief of giving them a second chance. So we're here as an outsider working with one organization that relies on a network of support structures that works with the community members. And then the community members themselves are often influenced by parole systems and the restrictions that influence the kind of activities that we can design ourselves. Through our work, we learned of several re-entry challenges, many of which have been documented before in other work, particularly in social work scholarship. But some of them were very particular to technology use. And that I want, I want to share that here. One of the things that was prominent was that the post uh, during the re-entry when they are in shelter homes or what they call halfway homes um, are focused on supervision over services. 
these uh, these programs are highly restrictive including putting restrictions on internet and technology access uh, also restricting people from seeing others or seeking social support and of course there is differences in the programs but more generally there is an emphasis on supervision and kind of like a prison after prison of running things than providing services that can help them in their re-entry re journey. Related to this, we heard a lot about unresponsive support structures. Uh, people were skeptic about the system that they thought did n was not set up in a way that supported them to successfully re-enter into society. There was limited support for issues with like for example social services, SSN numbers like the social security numbers were often uh, somebody else had stolen them, there was fraudulent uh, fraudulent uh, federal grant that somebody had claimed in their names that they couldn't fight and the parole system could not help them. There were also limited support for them to learn new skills or to find employment and many of the organizations or entities relied on recidivism rate which is a bare minimum likelihood of going back into prism is a bare minimum of successful re-entry so that kind of signifies the larger issue at hand and so we see parallels to the kind of problems that the sister survivors were facing in nepal as well here there was significant financial struggles in california uh, the system uh, provided 200 dollars of what is called gate money that 200 dollars is the highest in the united states but that's all the money that they get when they leave the prison. $200 isn't enough and that came up prominently throughout our discussions on the financial challenges that they face throughout the journey, particularly in the early part of their re-entry journey. There's also limited support for learning new skills which hinders their ability to be financially stable once they get out of the prison. They also come out and especially for people who've been in prison for a long time, they have to navigate a digitized society and the complex technological ecosystem that we take for granted. Even to do a simple, quote unquote, simple task these days, there's quite a lot of technological requirements. Think about taking a public transit, figuring out a nearest social service uh, or applying for a job. Many of these simple activities are quite complex. Um, it's, there is lack of trust in these systems that often look like a black box, especially when they lack digital literacy. And there's a, a lack of trust on institution that often translates to the technologies that those institutions deploy. And we saw that quite prominently in our study. Uh, the organization acknowledged that this was a big problem and one of the biggest challenges in supporting re-entry. And so they were trying to provide basic digital literacy lessons. But the organization had limited structure to do so. They often relied on YouTube videos to provide help with a certain technology. But technology is pretty broad. There are so many different problems you face. So they needed to provide one-on-one -on -one support, which sometimes got overwhelming uh, for the, uh, the staff members and they, they were seeking help on providing, getting some structured uh, digital literacy tool. And that is where we came in. The, the rich ecosystem of technology, you know, multiple modalities and multiple operating systems and multiple contexts in which technology is being used, which we take for granted often calling it as part of the seamfulness or seamlessness of technology use, was also one of the factors that complicated uh, their efforts because they needed to talk about multiple devices uh, or multiple use practices. So to provide help with, like provide some structure in the digital literacy aspect of the organization's work, we, we built on our initial interview and discussions to come up with a digital literacy tool that we co-designed with the staff members in the organization. Uh, the tool is designed particularly for the organization and it won't be generalizable all across because there are some features that are built in for specific for the organization. So the tool focused on six aspects of challenges that the sister survive, sorry, the, the uh, returning community members faced that included technology use in daily life, technology for class and work, technology safety and privacy, financial well-being and management, and job application support 
as well as accessing public services and resources. I'll just briefly talk about one particular feature just to show you how we designed this slow form of technology such that it enabled reflection and growth with the organization staff members. So one of the challenges that many mentioned was to apply for jobs, they needed a resume that was tailored in a format that ATS systems would work or application tracking systems would work, which often uses uh, AI systems these days. So we, the, the, when they are released from prison, they get a printed out form of a resume that is near impossible to parse by any OCR. And so we, we thought we'd kind of provide them help to first build a strong resume that is tailored to the jobs they want to apply, but also focus on some of the skills that they already possess but do not quite appreciate. And this prominently is for skills that they learn within, when they are in prison, but they think that is not applicable outside of prison. For example, being a welder or being managing a small team within the prison or teaching some program or some lessons within the prison. So we asked them to go to honestjobs.com, which is an indeed, but with jobs that are of companies that accept people who have criminal records. Uh, they, we asked them to search for positions they want read the job descriptions and identify the skills they are asking for and what you would like to highlight in your resume. And then note that skill on the side panel over here, kind of using it like a notebook. Uh, this was to be done with the staff members. This is not uh, an exercise to be done alone. The communal or uh, the mutual support from the staff members was critical in this case. Once they noted this down, it reflected when they built the resume. Now, the resume needed a particular format, so we implemented an HTML form that would generate a formatted resume at the end. So when they were filling in the form, for example, in case of like recent professional experiences, it reminded them, hey, you noticed these, you had noted down these skills that were important when you're applying for a job, highlight these when you're writing descriptions in your resume. Uh, this was to nudge them to express some of the strengths that they already have and to get the staff members to kind of work with them to identify and uncover those strengths and ways to communicate those strengths when applying for a job. Overall, in all of this design exercise, we try to incorporate the, the system within the organization's existing work. This is to build in that reciprocity so that the organization gets something in return for their engagement with us. This meant for us that staff members had the control, had the entire control of the content. What tutorials would go in the website, how they would run the, the resume building system, all of that would be run by the staff members. Uh, the application itself is owned by the organization. We help build it, but we hand it over to the organization. And in fact, right now, it's, it's the organization that owns the system. Uh, the job application support mechanism also required the staff members to lead it. They were the ones who were guiding the individuals in building or preparing those resumes together. The forms are easily modifiable so that the individuals can also tailor it on their, in their time depending on the kinds of jobs they are applying, but primarily requires the staff members to guide them and help them work and they expect it to work together. The second one is what I call low floor, high ceiling, building on Seymour Papert's work from long ago in educational technology. That is to attend to the differing levels of technical skills that is present within returning community members. Some have tech literacy, others do not. So how do we design such that it is applicable for all people across the board? So we, we sought to provide easy entry so that everybody can get started, but also provide resources that can let people with more skills to get something out of the system. Uh, for example, a simple example of this is the system does not require any login for anyone who wants to get started. If they don't trust the website, they can play around without providing any information. And they can log in if, on if and only if they want to build a resume. We needed to save it for that profile, so we created the login feature for that. Uh, 
we also provided access to public resources beyond our web application. In particular, we use a website called findhelp.org, which is a nationally vetted website that provides resources for marginalized and different groups of people. And we incorporated that rather than reinventing the wheel or creating another system. This was with the hope that once they move out from the organization, they still have some tools or are equipped with some knowledge that they can make use later on as well. So now let's take a step back from all of this and reflect on what I shared just now so that I can kind of reiterate on those three pillars again. Um, the focus on the methods meant that methods should embody the values we aspire with their work. Right? There is a goal we have in mind. We can build some of those values within the methods. In, in the examples that I shared, there was emphasis on ha the participants having greater comfort and control in their participation, as well as flexibility in the degree of participation that they wanted in those activities. Uh, we also sought to look for playful opportunities, such as with the photography session or the embedded electronics, but also collaborative experiences, such as with the resume builder. We sought to adapt to local conditions and make use of local resources, the best example being that of the poster that led to the photo elicitation exercise, but also to acknowledge that the organization is already providing digital literacy programs and to am amplify those efforts by building a a system that aligns with those goals. So relying on familiar materials and familiar methods, as well as centering the organization are some of these efforts that tries to build those values and tries to kind of make sure that the methods align with the, in the setting. The second pillar talked about technology as a means. And here, like, I want to emphasize the importance of focusing on users' goals and aspirations. And this is is the bread and butter of human-centered design or user-centered design. But it also, the emphasis on those goals also sometimes means that we, can, we may need to re-evaluate our research goals and our research agenda. Um, moving away from soluble electronics is, a, is an example of that, right? Like there's plenty of potential to explore how these soluble electronics can be of value in engagement. But because the sister survivors did not see future visions with those, it did not make sense to push it forward. Uh, there's also to think about the processes that design can affect, right? Fundamentally, all these problems that we're trying to solve is a social problem, right? And they require social solutions. Trying to solve a social problem with technical solutions is like putting a square peg in a round hole or something like that. Technology though, can be a means to support those social solutions. So emphasizing those social solutions and looking at technology as a means to support that can help. Uh, an example of this to look at, particularly to look at how do we design after the project ends, is to think about can we hand it over to people who care about the systems we build, somebody who benefits from the system and is motivated to maintain or sustain that system. So one of the plans of handing over the technology to the organization, along with the capacity building workshops so that the organization can make use of that system, can help with goals of sustainability. The third pillar was about building relationship as an end in itself. And here, I advocate for moving slow and building things, particularly building trust. And this goes against that Silicon Valley credo of move fast and break things, right? All of the LLMs and GPTs and all the push for these modern technologies often do not pay attention to what happens when those things break. And when working with communities, particularly communities that are already marginalized, already vulnerable, we have to think about who bears the cost of when those things break when those relationships fail. Technology is meaningful. I'm in CS, I love technology, that's why I'm CS. But it is meaningful in the sense that it amplifies some of the social realities that are there. Now, if we do not pay attention to those social realities, those technology can amplify the negative aspects, such as power inequities. If you look at 
corrupt governments, right? Often technology is used as a facade to say we are transparent, but there is greater corruption, right? Then this theory from that comes from Kentaro Toyama about technology as an amplifier, kind of emphasizes the importance of paying attention to the social realities before thinking about technology. And also we need to ask ourselves, what does the community gain from working with us? Yes, research is important. Yes, building knowledge is important. But building knowledge for academic sake is only one aspect of being in this interdependent world. So we need to think about how do we build reciprocity such that the community gains something from their engagement with us. Right? And that is important in every step of our work. So briefly, before I end, I just want to kind of mention some of the ongoing work at our lab. Uh, I see a few people here. Uh, I'll briefly mention that. Uh, in, in addition to the ongoing work with the uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, we're also working with a nonprofit in India in their work with women who've just left an abusive relationship and are struggling to find home late, like after having left a long-term relationship. And we're working with the nonprofit to design systems as well as mechanisms for the organization to provide help to those women. Uh, Alejandro and the group are also looking at community-driven approaches to support preservation and promotion of low resource languages. We've just begun this work. Partly the focus will be in the context of indigenous languages in Nepal, but there's broader implications of thinking about what, does, what can technology do to kind of help communities preserve and promote their languages. Uh, with a small group of students, uh, undergraduate students, I'm also exploring opportunities for political empowerment through socially situated data literacy programs, particularly within the context of Pittsburgh, especially with, in collaboration with the Community Engagement Center. And with that, I think I'll come to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of work, I'm looking for collaborators and also students. So join us at yet to be named, but tentatively Style Lab. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop here and then open for questions while I read some of these. What are some dishes you cook well? Oh, uh, what are some of the dishes that you cook well? Uh, <laughs> that's an important question. Uh, um, I, I don't know how to kind of say about some things that I cook well, but some of the things that I cook that I really enjoy are momos, which is a staple dish for Nepali people, but also a dish called thukpa, which is a Tibetan noodle soup food that I really like. And I enjoy eating that more, so I think I cook that well, I guess. Uh, what are some of the ways in which you engaged in member checking in the context of this research? Uh, yes, okay. So I'm going to guess that this is for the Nepal project, but I'm going to generalize it for both. Uh, in, in Nepal's case, I borrowed a lot from participatory action research. That is to kind of go back to the community saying, hey, this is what we learned in the previous iteration of the work. These are the things that we kind of talking about you. Would you have any feedback or suggestions? Or are we truly saying what you, what you wanted us to say about you? I'll give you an example of this. Like one of the organizations that I was working with called PO, had a different goal when it came to technology use. They devised a way to uh, scan faces at the border to potentially stop someone who may have been in missing person's record. But when I asked to audit the, the database with which they were building this facial recognition system, they refused saying that they do not want any questions around the technology use. That did not align with the values that I had. The, the technology should not be used for surveillance purposes like this especially when it is not well verified. And so, so because there wasn't a goal, a matching goal, I uh, stepped back from that collaboration. So my subsequent work were with only with the other organization, which I call SO or survivor organization. But with SO, I was transparent about what I was writing about them, what I was saying to, saying to others about them, even give, like asking them if they would like to participate as scholars or contributors to the work. Uh, these work were first like written in English for conferences like CHI and CSCW. Then parts of it were translated in Nepali so that the partners would understand. And then we would discuss those findings with them. 
along the way we discussed about our ideations about the steps or designs we'd come up with get feedback in the process involve them in the design iterations as well and then de develop the system which is which is very central to like approaches of participatory design. So that is the kind of quote unquote member checking that we did. But it, because it is participatory and also builds a little bit on action research, it went beyond member checking. Any questions? Yes. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that you're looking at a, a smaller community and what works within that community. Would you be able to generalize it to a larger society and think about what sort of technologies can have societal impact? Is that what you're saying? Ah. Yes, okay, that's, that's a wonderful question. And that goes to the center core of participatory design. In participatory design, we talk about one mutual learning, that is we learn from the communities and build knowledge, but also the community learns and engages with us to gain something towards their vision of the future. That's the primary goal. But the second part of it is that participatory design opens up avenues for future envisioning and alternative possibilities. And then the designers are what Akama and, uh, and Light call the, have the human touch or should have that human touch to enable those broader envisionments and uh, exploration of alternative futures. Uh, we engaged with that. This, this design that I talked about is one of the many that opened up, but the one that the community was most excited or saw most value from it. Often what shapes community's perspective is what they see around them right now. For the organization in Nepal, the vision around Computing education was partly because there were other nonprofits that were also providing computing literacy. And so that became a, a particular aspirations for the future. With the nonprofit here in the US, they also had similar goals, partly because they noticed digital literacy as being a significant barrier. And because they were associated with an educational institution, the educational aspect became a com like a, a aligned goal for them. So some of these visions we do explore as part of the participatory design, but those visions are also like we need to acknowledge that they are also shaped by the realities on the ground. Right? And so, yes, we do engage in alternative envisionment and we have had, we've done several other explorations on other ideas. One of the ideas was to redesign a snake and ladder game, a classic game that is played in Nepal, a, a dice based game. And we re envisioned in creating or recreating that snake and ladder to see if that could open avenues for the sister survivors to have deeper conversations with other staff members. That deployment did not work well as well, partly because the staff members were a little hesitant on playing a childish like game, right? They are older adults who run the organization. It's the kids who, like, I mean, they are actually kids, right? Like these are young girls who, who like to play games. So some of these envisionments do not work, some others work. And this one that I presented are the, of course, if I'm presenting it, I'll present those things that work, right? Um, any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Wonderful. Uh, well, very well. Um, I had a question about the handoffs. And so um, you talked a little bit explicit, you know, you talked about that explicitly as like kind of work that you're heading to do next. But I'm kind of curious, so like in the recidivism or not, but um, in the reintegration, reentry into society work, you, you know, you built this resume platform for helping design resumes. I presume there's a, uh, you know, you're going to hand off this technology to the organization who will then manage it and run it and continue to use it. Um, 
to what extent is the capacities and the capabilities of the organization, not necessarily the people using the system, but the context within which the system may be deployed, how are you integrating that into your design process and your design thinking and into the design of these systems such that it, you know, it doesn't require somebody with a PhD in computer science to, to run a PhD developer, but also to think about maintenance and just like the long term. Yeah. Also probably applies to the, the work of the system. Yes, that's a wonderful question. And the, like, even though we, we are experts of technology, one of the design constraints is to ensure that the technology is designed in such a way that the community partners can maintain and sustain it once it's handed over. And that has been the goal in the design of the system. Um, in the case of Nepal, we had a series of workshops to help the staff members learn about technology, learn about the systems. There was a bigger problem around resources, uh, partly because they didn't have computers that they could use. So we gathered some resources, like money, actually, uh, which, which of course does not count as research, but it's part of the reality on the ground. So we collected money to kind of connect internet to the shelter home, provide a computer to be used in the shelter home, and then train some of the staff members to learn about those technologies that are being used. Now, in, in Nepal's case, we handed it over. Uh, they, the work is still ongoing in some ways, but there are institutional realities. After COVID, the organization kind of folded some of the donors that had promised money based on which they, they were running some of the uh, organization's work. They pulled off like because COVID kind of created that panic. And they were, in fact, closing down some of the shelter homes. So we, I raised off, I did a fundraiser here to gather some money to send back so that the shelter home could run. But after that, the organization has been kind of in a path of decline with many of the staff members who were championing the work have since left the organization and moved on to other places. It's also one of the unsaid or unspoken thing here. In the collaboration, you, you need people to champion within the organization. It's not going to happen. People do not see value just because you bring value. Somebody has to be there within the organization that champions your work. And if those champions leave, then it becomes uh, you, you're back to square one where you start, where you need to start building that relationship again. And in Nepal's case, that is where we are again, partly because the organization forked, some of the people left, but the system is still there. It just, it's kind of withering away, sadly. In the case of uh, the organization in San Francisco, it's not quite that. They are a robust organization with staff members who are keen on doing this. M many of the staff members are people who were in prison before, so they, they are familiar with the problem and are committed to the cause. In fact, the organization is one of the 14 organizations that is spread all across California, so there's an opportunity to tap into a larger network of support once we get buy-in from one of the organizations. Here, we, we've looked at designing ways in, in ways that is comfortable for the staff members, creating workshop for the staff members to learn about these technologies, including involving them in the iterations of the design so that they can give us feedback on what makes sense to them and what does not. Several of the design elements have been influenced or directly copied from some of the suggestions that the staff members provided us. Uh, we're also training or working with one of the staff members who's familiar with web development, basic web development, to kind of hand it over to him or through him to other people in the organization. So there have been these work that goes before the work and then also the work that goes after the work. Like once you publish the paper, there are also work that is necessary to build that infrastructure. So all those work are going on in, in the case of San Francisco. In the case of Nepal, it's slightly slow. Alejandro, I, I saw your hand. Um, so how do you, for one day envision possible features, how do you distinguish between what's feasible and what could just be considered higher? Yes, yeah, that, that is a good question. And, and this comes back to that mutual learning part of it, right? As designers and experts of technology, we have the responsibility to tone down the hype of technology. Oftentimes, when there is novel technology introduced, there is this enormous aspiration on what it can solve. The current era of AI definitely kind of falls in this group. There's a group of people who are on the extreme thinking about the hype. The other group were much more worried about the potential impact. The reality may be somewhere in between. But as experts, we are the ones who kind of have to talk through and discuss what that vision means. Um, 
in the case of the organization for example uh, i'll give the example in nepal the organization wanted us to think about in in one of the design exercises to think about a surveillance system that would help us track all the people who have been all the young girls that are being reached out through social media like facebook and uh, i think instagram and there is another like very local app that is often used by traffickers to reach out to young girls and ask them to cross the border without anyone being involved it's a real problem but the approach that we were thinking or the potential approach that the organization was thinking was to surveil all social media through the government's help through the telecoms involvement so in that case it becomes our responsibility to talk about the negative impact of these technologies to talk about the limitations of these kind of surveillance technologies and the potential harms that can happen so taking it as an exercise of mutual learning and discussion as we are envisioning these alternative possibilities creates that opportunities for moving forward one of the things that we did was to kind of say can we tabulate a record of information from people who were rescued to ask them how they've been trafficked document that and use that as an awareness creation approach right that became a process that came from that surveillance based design envisionment so reframing it and thinking about what is the essence or what is important here and to talk about that and instead of like the more broader anything goes kind of technological vision is helpful Does that makes sense yes The Soable Electronics was ours. The Photoshop was the organizations that failed. Yeah. yeah. So how, how do you handle like, these kind of unsuccessful things happening in the middle? Do you establish trust in? Yeah. Uh, how do I handle as a researcher? Pretty badly. How do I handle, <laughs> how do I handle as, a, as a collaborator and somebody who wants what is good for the community? In that case, vulnerability is the key, right? Being transparent, open early on to say hey this came out from an earlier study we're thinking of this as an exploration not that we're certain about it yes kylie pepler and yasmin kafai have written quite a lot about the soable electronics and like diy maker spaces in the us we're trying to see if it transfers to nepali context we're not certain and that it may fail right that kind of transparency is important the reason why i'm saying this is it's not just us, like, I'll, I'll cite a scholar, like, Morgan Ames wrote this book on one laptop per child project called The Charismatic Machine. And in it, she writes about this case where she argues that, imagine a child who's been given this fancy laptop from MIT. Negropon Nicholas Negroponte wanted to drop the laptop from a helicopter and somehow it would change the world. That was their vision. But nonetheless, a fancy laptop created by experts in MIT. And you get this laptop, you try to use it, but the laptop is poorly executed, it fails. You don't know it's poorly executed. You think this is state of the art system. Now, when it fails, what's gonna happen to that young kid, right? They're gonna imbibe the belief that these experts from MIT tried to help me and I, yet I fail. I'm of no good use, like there's nothing that can help me, right? There's this negative cycle that we can enable when we fail in our engagement, right? Fail, especially when we promise lofty goals with technology. And that was something that I was also worried about here because we were going in with a promise of technology, right? Our expertise is technical. That is how we built that relationship with both the organizations. And so thinking about what kind of expectations we are setting, what kind of change are we envisioning with the, the sister survivors as well as with the staff members here is really critical. And that often gets missed out with the current type of AI systems, right? And so building trust also means our willingness to be vulnerable. We are, like, we have tons of resources from the institution. We have our expertise of technology and research. We are the ones who are building knowledge in the world, at least one form of knowledge. Um, and so we go in with a lot of power and it becomes really difficult to be vulnerable when you have such power. So it, it does require a lot of effort. I, I'm not saying I'm successful with it, but it just is an ongoing effort of trying to understand how do we reduce that power differences. Yeah. Yes. So um, at what point, 
specifically with the embedded electronics, did you realize that the workshop didn't work out, and how did you uh, pivot from that? Yes. So it 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 worked out wonderfully throughout the workshop. Like the two workshop ran well. There's novelty effect at play in this case, right? Uh, there's new technologies. There's electronics that you can play with. You're, you're measuring the current, and then it's lighting up in the pattern that you want on the skirt that you've designed. You can wear that skirt and so on. So there's quite a lot of fascinating special fascination, especially considering that you know many of the participants are pretty young girls, right? And so playfulness matters here. But once we concluded the exercise and had a work discussion session on these exercises, we started p thinking about what do we do in the future? What should be the next step? And indeed, that's when it came up, right? Like we, we heard stories of they not wanting to do this, partly because they were worried that if this becomes something that the organization sees as value, then they're going to be asked to do a lot more crafting rather than thinking about other futures. They, they knew what they wanted. It's just that they didn't have an avenue to pursue those paths. So they didn't want to solidify the path that, you know, that, they, that did not align with their goals. And we could, like in the discussions, we could understand, like we could gather that. Later on, the analysis, the qualitative analysis kind of made it very clear that there was a misalignment. And so we decided not to pursue that. They mentioned that the computing aspect of it was interesting. So that's how we moved back to the Hamburg-Kolla introduction and then move forward again with Wikipedia and Google search, which are much widely used and something that fits well with their aspirations for the future. There's some comments in the chat. If nobody here has a question, I'm going to quickly read that. Would it be more helpful to consider a system of integrated technological tool in the form of, in the form, uh, in the form of tech ecosystem towards better digital literacy? and some uh, work with uh, digital literacy. Yes, it could. Uh, if, if we could tailor the technological tools to the particular context, uh, especially considering the variance in digital skills and digital knowledge. I'm, I'm gathering that this is for the second project. Considering the variance in the digital skills and digital knowledge, we need to carefully think about how we tailor it. Some of the technologies that often is pushed is, is very much surveillance driven. And when people do not trust the institutions, they are not going to trust the technologies that are designed by those institutions. Think of Palantir designing a classroom management app, like how many of us would trust it, right? So uh, there's, there's, it could work, a general framework definitely would be much welcome, but it would also need to be flexible enough such that it could be tailored to the particularities of the context. I am not, and then I'm sure this comes across in my talk as well. I'm not in favor of thinking about generalizability. I am very much, partly because of the context of my work with marginalized populations, I'm more of in the favor of thinking about what learnings from this particular work can be transferred on other context, rather than pushing for generalizability. Because oftentimes, generalizability requires us to ignore the particular nuanced differences or the particular nuanced aspects of the context. And that nuanced aspect is where the magic happens. Right? That is what enables those design opportunities to come. It is those tensions or figuring out balance, how to balance those tensions is where design happens. And those tensions or the power dynamics that are at play is going to be unique for every context. So even for the second project, as one of the things I was trying to do, I'm trying to do is transfer some of the things from San Francisco to Pittsburgh, where the context is slightly different. In San Francisco, many of the returning community members aspire for a technical job because that's what that there is for a majority. But in Pittsburgh, when talking to the nonprofit organization, they mentioned that for many, the pathway is through construction jobs. So in that case, the kind of technology that we provide through this digital literacy tool will not apply. We need to think about alternative ways to kind of support them. Or maybe there isn't any role for technology, and that's also perfectly fine. But to understand those nuanced differences in the context becomes quite critical. And thus, like, I'm not very much in favor of uh, thinking about generalizability in my work. Yeah, this is <laughs> Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you everyone.